Hello, my name is Jason Peck, and this is a comedy Q&A interview with actor, author, director, and teacher Bill Kincaid. Bill actually taught my wife Melissa Shakespeare when she was at college, and he has a really unique approach to the text. I will just warn you though that the audio and the visual can get a little bit wobbly in this uh, interview, so you're probably going to want to check out the transcript. And if you're really interested in Bill's approach to Shakespeare, take a look at his book, Performing Shakespeare Unrehearsed. Thanks. Hello. Hello. Um, uh, yeah, this is um, this is great getting to. I've heard a lot about you um, over the last however many years, Melissa. Ten years, Melissa and I have been yeah. uh, married now. Um, all good things. All good things, Bill. That's good. Um, so, if you don't mind, I just like to jump right into it. Absolutely. Um, okay. So, could you just Tell me just a little bit about your background. Sure. So uh, I was a very divided youth between music and theater. Didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, was a theater major. Didn't get the role I wanted. Transferred to a music school. Discovered that wasn't for me. Went to graduate school in theater. Uh, I met some great people in graduate school mm -hmm. who uh, steered me on the course that I really wound up on as a freelance director and actor until I came into academia about 20 years ago. Uh, but about 12 years ago, I was hired by the New England Shakespeare Festival as an actor. First exposed to Q script, technique, Shakespeare, whatever different people want to call it. Okay, so it was in uh, when you were hired by the New England Shakespeare, that's when you just were uh, learned the the un the unrehearsed technique, right? Right, exactly. Yep. Got it. And before we before we sort of delve further into that, um, you've you've directed actors where they've rehearsed and they've learned their lines, right? Yes. In okay. fact, I'm in the middle of a production like that now. Oh, great. Okay. So, and obviously, I asked that because we just lightly touched on it. You you were involved with. Um, obviously, you learn the technique of the New England Shakespeare, and you were involved with a company called uh, the Unrehearsed Shakespeare Company, which was founded and run by alumni of Western Illinois University, right? Right. Right. And you, right. Were, you were involved with My that. connection with them is only through the alumni. I've actually right. never done a show with them, but uh, okay. but those as my former students, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of it. Got work. it. Yeah. Right. And, you, and so you taught them this technique. Could you tell yeah. me... Uh, and you learned it in New England Shakespeare. Could you tell me a little bit more about the technique and how that sort of came to be? Sure. There's a there's actually an excellent book exploring the history of, of people's relationship to this kind of original practice and how what we call unrehearsed Shakespeare came out of that, written by a guy named Don Weingust. Uh, the book will be acting from Shakespeare's folio, I think. But... The sorry, sorry, idea. sorry, Don, you broke up on me briefly there. What was the title of the book? Uh, it's called Acting from Shakespeare's First Folio. Got it. Um, and he talks about how there was a, a man, Richard Flatter, a German who was translating Shakespeare into German. Okay. And couldn't account for some things he discovered in the language. There were some, some patterns emerging that didn't make sense to him. He was a native speaker, so he asked some other people about it. I'm, of course, I'm turning this into a little uh, uncomplicated fairy tale, but essentially he asked some native speakers, and they said, oh, no, that's, that's the way Shakespeare is, but there's no particular reason. And he wasn't satisfied with that answer, so he continued to probe and started, this was about 75 years ago, started evolving some of the ideas that led us to where we are. Um, a really good example would be the uh, of how the technique works would be yeah. the use of words like this, that, the difference between this water bottle which I have to be touching and that well I can't put it in for any of this but that water bottle which is at some distance from me that these things dictate blocking in unrehearsed Shakespeare especially when you're talking not about a water bottle but a person if you're speaking of a person and calling them this man, you have to be close to them on stage. 
If you're calling them Batman, you have to be far away. So depending on where you are, your orientation to them when you begin the line, you may be receiving instructions to create distance or create proximity based on the specific words in your line. Okay. Wow. Okay. Wow, it's just sort of like... <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, really good one, although it's more complex, is the relationship between the words thou and you. Yeah. As second person singular and second people, which we essentially use as also for markers of proximity and distance, because thou tends to be more intimate, so you always obey a thou or a thee or a thy, thine, by getting very close to the person you're speaking to, invading their personal space. And for if you're using the similar forms of you, you create more distance. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's pretty I, great. It, it is. I'm shaking my head because I, you know, I'm I'm sure I'm gonna, I'm sure I'm gonna get more as we keep going. But you know, I just sort of reflect back how much easier, you know, my time with Shakespeare over the years would have been, you know, when I was in college and when I was in high school. You know, if they would have gone, oh, do this and this and this, and you and you kind of it would have op unlocked so much more. Um, okay, uh, that's great. Um, so, so to be clear then, the, there's no rehearsal at all and essentially you're not really rehearsing, but it's all spontaneous during the show. Right. So one of my favorite phrases actually is unrehearsed doesn't mean unprepared. So there's, you can put in tremendous amounts of preparation. Uh, and the recommendation is, in fact, that you work with, I'm going to be teaching a course in this this semester, um, and so I'm, right now I'm trying to develop how this works best in a classroom setting, but we'll be having everyone, everyone in the class will be assigned as coach or text coach for another person. Okay. So you work with that person privately, they make sure that you are catching on to all the clues that are, that are within the text, so you work on this alone, but then on the day of performance, everyone who has prepared shows up together and presents the results of their preparation together. We do allow, in our particular model, we allow one hour beforehand before the performance, or we refer to as rehearsed segments. Those are songs, dances, fights. Um, maybe big scene changes where someone, you can't have chaos while everybody's wondering who brings on the throne. Right, right. We establish that beforehand. So we have an hour of rehearsed segments in advance. Got it. Okay. And then so you you would essentially then you go on, when I say you, I'm, as a, if you were an actor, you would go and work on your own part. So you're yeah. not there suddenly doing a, like a, a cold sight reading. Right. right? Okay, and you're like, I don't know what any of these yeah. words mean. Got it. So at least you understand yeah. your yeah. part, and you've got, and am I correct in understanding you've got your cue, like a, a, a cue prior to you speaking, and then... Yes, exactly. An, out, an outline to who's speaking next? Uh, you don't actually know who's speaking next. You only have, you have your cue, four syllables or so, of your cue followed by your entire line. Right. So you got to listen up. <laughs> yeah. You might be standing on stage for four minutes yeah. waiting for your cue, and you have no idea when it's going to come. So it's a, <laughs> it's a really exhilarating feeling to know at any moment I could be required to speak. So you're very alert. It brings an alertness that yeah. rehearsed productions have a hard time duplicating yeah. because, you know, I, I find myself frequently uh, telling actors you know, your character hasn't read the end of the scene. They don't know where this is going. Yeah. So they may be constantly trying to break in or considering breaking in. But when you know, because you've seen it on the page, the other person has a speech this long before I talk, there's no reason to be on the alert, right? right. People very often gear up right at the end of that speech. They feel yeah. it coming and yeah. they start to get ready for their line. Yeah. This eliminates that. 
for sure. Right. Yeah. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm on stage. I know you've got a page of text, and I'm now thinking about my cat. What 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 I'm having for dinner tonight? I'm trying not to drift off, but I'm sort of in and out. You're still talking. I can drift off again. Oh no! Wait. Now yep. it's now now it's me. Oh, it's me, me, me. <laughs> right. Yep. And it, exactly. you eliminate that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And everyone's present and alive. I love it. Okay. Um, I'm I'm sorry if I, I'm I think as I'm thinking about this. And, and digesting it, I'm, you know, I'm slowing down a little bit. So just to sort of give you a heads up as I, uh, you know, because this is all brand new for me, obviously. Um, so and everyone has their lines with them, right? So does anyone, I mean, do you, you're walking around with multiple scrolls? Is that how it works? Uh, you have one? one, right, one scroll for your character. And the way, I, unfortunately, because I am, on location now, and I, I didn't plan ahead well enough. I don't have one of them with me to show you. And that's no problem. Uh, but they are, they're about this big, I guess, and they're put together in such a way that you can easily hold them in one hand, and they're tightly wound. You can just um, advance them like a little mini Elizabethan teleprompter. Okay. So you can reference it at any time you want. Uh, as we've already established, right, you're not really cold reading, so it's not like you have this relationship. Yeah. But it's it's there with you. Um, if you've prepared enough, you may only be referencing it periodically. Yeah. Uh, you can tap people with it. You can use it as an extension of your hand point. Yeah. Uh, great for dirty jokes when right. they come up. Yeah. So, yeah. This is really good. I'm. I'm. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> this is great. Um, so that. So that. And obviously, because I I had a question, but you've sort of answered it in advance. You know. There is a certain amount of preparation, at least with their own, you know, an actor's own part. So then they, they're not going to get confused because they, they've only got the one scroll. And they, you know, they're not going to be like, who's talking now? Where, which scroll am I using? That was, that was right. how it was in my imagination. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Um, I w actually, yeah. I'll even add to that, that uh, there's certainly doubling. Doubling, right? Yeah. You're, you're playing perhaps multiple characters but you would still put those all in one scroll. So you would just have a notation to yourself in the scroll. Yeah. You know, uh, I've been playing, I don't know, Exeter, and now I'm going to re-enter as Richmond. Yes. So you run off stage, you have a little note to yourself, I need to change my hat and jacket. Right. Now I'm Richmond, and I'm back in with my next cue. Right. And that would work with something like um, Midsummer Night's Dream is often doubled up, isn't it, with the, yeah. the fairies yeah. and the court. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... You were mentioning the 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 book that you make, mentioned acting from Shakespeare's first folio, um, and obviously, un, you know, the unrehearsed theatre company, uh, unrehearsed Shakespeare theatre company, uses that as well. Why is the why is the first folio uh, important? Because I know there were like other quarters, as second quarter and so on. Why is this one important? Do you think? Well, there's been a lot of. of scholarship and scholarly debate over the years, certainly not unique to uh, unrehearsed Shakespeare or even original practice more broadly, about whether the folio is the most important authority. And there are people who come down on both sides of that debate. Um, certainly if you talk to, I have friends who are English professors who will, for a given text, they'll say, you know, no, the authoritative text of this play is the quarto not folio, etc. Uh, unrehearsed Shakespeare, at least with the in the cases of the people that I've worked with, unrehearsed generally considers the folio to be the authority that they want to work from. Um, okay. There are there are arguments to be made on both sides, and uh, I even I, quite a few years ago we did a production of Richard the Second where we didn't use the folio text, we used the quarto instead, just to see. With most of the plays, there are gigantic, 18 of them exist under the quarto, 18 of them only exist in the first folio. So those, right. obviously, you're only working from one authority. Um, with the others that, that are for some debate, the differences are often cosmetic, a matter of okay. some punctuation marks here and there. Right. Um, but then there are all cases are there are very different versions, for example, of King Lear. 
vastly different version where some cut and some added him. The scenes happen in a different order. So at some point, anyone doing any production of one of those plays has to make decisions about what they're going to use and what they're going to not use. Are they going to do some kind of conflated version of the two? Right. Um, there becomes some form of editorial intervention on the part of the director, sometimes because they're forced. It's like choose your own adventure, right? You have yeah. to do the other. Folio or Porto. And yeah. uh, typically, although as I said, Richard II was an exception, typically we've always worked with the folio. Um, generally speaking, those texts are a little more available. You can get facsimile, a facsimile first folio. I have one in my office. You can get a... Um, Oh, I can't even think of the, the proper term for this. But you can get a first folio that is, is in contemporary typeset as okay. well. There are lots of different ways to get a hold of that text. And I think that's probably a lot of the reason, well, at least for me, why we haven't experimented more with the portos and we've stuck to the folio. It's, uh, and, and I would stop short of making a really strong argument that the folio is always right no matter what. But you have to have some system because as soon as you start making excuses for the text you're working with, yeah. then you can do anything. And that's not the goal. The goal is to do what's written. Right. Then the question becomes, but what is written? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but then wouldn't that, it, it, preclude, it does preclude you from using some of the plays though, right? I mean, it would, wouldn't it preclude oh, you from yeah. using Two Noble Kinsmen and Pericles? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've never done either of those. There are okay. period versions of those plays that we could oh. do, and we would just know we're not doing, you know, this is not the first folio. It exists in the first folio. We're doing it differently. Uh, we did this once with, a, I would love to do more uh, experimental stuff with this. Um, the problem is it's, it's time consuming and resource consuming to do this. So I've had fewer opportunities to experiment with non Shakespearean plays or non folio plays. We did Ben Johnson's Volpone yeah. uh, a number of years ago uh -huh. just to see, you know, so what if you applied this to another contemporary play, right? Not written by Shakespeare. And I would love to do more of that for fun to see what are the differences, what are the similarities. So, yeah, you know, Sir Thomas was brought into that same category of, of non folio text, but text that theoretically could operate very much the same way, right? And what just I know this is a uh, isn't a question that I sent you, but it just as it came up, what was your just brief, uh, briefly, what was your findings by doing Ben Johnson's Volpone using this technique? Did it, yeah. Did it bring it, it alive, or? It works. Uh, one thing that was really different about Johnson uh, that I realized doing it, Shakespeare very, very rarely has uh, lines so short that they don't have four syllables to cue the next person. There are cases, King John, there's a, a little exchange between a couple characters where uh, each one of them only has two or three syllables at a time for a, sh okay. for a brief period. But in Volpone, it happened several times where someone had a one-syllable line or a two-syllable line, um, and it really made me question, you know, okay, so what, what does this mean? What's, what's the intention of this? Or uh, did, it, did Johnson intend for it to work differently? Because yeah. it's really hard if you're holding a cue script. It's one thing to be, as we talked about, always alert, Yes. waiting for that during somebody's long speech. It's another thing to finish your line and have the other person say, of course. <laughs> and then you're supposed to go on. Um, those one-syllable cues were, were challenging. Um, otherwise, you know, basically, it's an Elizabethan play. So, you know, the things that you learn from one, generally speaking, apply at least in broad strokes to another. Yeah, right. Okay, interesting. Now you um, now your projects, you mostly um, do work in Macomb, Illinois, right? Yes. Okay, and you do those projects under the name Bard in the Barn. Is that right? Did I understand yeah. that correct? Okay. Um, could you just tell me a little bit more about those projects? 
why why is it why have you called it Bard in the Barn? What is that? Well, now Bard in the Barn is become a bit of a because of some some changes. We we were working with the city of Macomb originally. Yeah, I took the, the city of Macomb as a sort of town uh, project, right? That we could do, hoping that we could do something together, where the university theater could present something that would be a town project as well. And right at the same time, they were looking for um, they were looking for an opportunity to showcase the local historic barns. And okay. so huh. in the middle of this conversation where I was saying, you know, I'd like to do something, maybe we could, maybe in a downtown space, I, I just, I really didn't know exactly what it would be. I was hoping it would take, take some kind of form. And the, um, the woman that I was speaking to said, Bard in the Barn. Huh. I think she interrupted me even, and I said, I beg your pardon, we call it Bard in the Barn. We're wanting to showcase these barns. So we started doing that. We did it at a a couple different historic barns. They had a big event that they called Barnacopia huh. in the fall to promote the barns, and we became a, a fixture of that. So we would do, in a given weekend, we would do three different productions, two on Saturday and one on Sunday, all outside of a, with a barn as the backdrop. We never actually did it in a barn, but okay. we uh, we would set the costume racks up inside the barn, and sometimes, in one case, that was really wonderful, we did a big reveal in uh, Winter's Tale. If you know Winter's Tale, it was a, a big reveal of the statue of Hermione. Okay. We actually did it by uh, parting the, the barn doors, and the actor was oh. standing there. And that became what I referenced before, a, a rehearsed segment. We right. knew we wanted to do it like that, so we rehearsed that. Right. Okay. So, yeah, that's how it became Bard in the Barn. Um, then there were some a number of changes. Uh, part of it is that we were getting grant money that is no longer available to us. Right. And so it, it's taken on a different form now. Uh, we're going to be doing some productions in the spring, in April, right around Shakespeare's birthday. But those are going to be on our campus, unfortunately not. Well, no, I mean, it's great that they're on our campus. But yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, we've lost the community connection that we did have at one point. Right, right, right. Okay, so and and so because of that, you're so those productions are mainly now on campus, right? Yes. So if I wanted, yeah. so if I or someone watching this wants to come and see a show, probably wouldn't be able to do that because it's on a college campus. Oh no, it's absolutely public. Uh, they'll oh. be they'll be part of our university season. Got it. Um, Interesting too. Do you mind my? Do we have time for me to go off on a bit of a tangent? Yeah, thing? sure. Do you? As long as you do. So yeah, they they've given us a, a slot in our studio theater season okay. for the year, and uh, it's always a little difficult for theater folks. Actors tend to relate to unrehearsed Shakespeare pretty quickly, or at least think that the idea is exciting. Other theater folks have a little more trouble processing what we're trying to do with this. I think especially in in any theater, which certainly academia is this way, where there's a very specific process that you always follow. You know, yeah. six weeks in advance we have to have the technical drawings. Five weeks in advance we you know, all of those things. So my colleagues have assigned me a scenic designer, a costume designer, etc., from from among the graduate students in the design program and uh, and are assuming that we will have a tech week. Well, you can't do a traditional tech week yeah. on a show that is not rehearsed. Right. So I was trying to figure out how to do that because they they feel it's very important to stick to that regular schedule and specifically mm -hmm. for the lighting designer. And I did explain, you realize the lighting designer won't be able to, it, really what we're talking about is general illumination of a space. Yeah. Defining where acting can and cannot happen because you won't get to see the show in advance and you're really going to create problems if you try to respond in the show and create cues given where people are. I, yes. I just think that was too big of a mess. Yeah. So what we've set on for Tech Week is that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of that week, the entire cast will be present and every night they'll do a different play. 
So the designers will get to watch, in a sense, they'll have a tech week because the lighting designer can put something up and see yeah. how it functions with us doing an unrehearsed play. But when it comes to our opening on Friday night, we're going to do something we've never done before. And then Saturday night, we'll do another show we've never done before. Right. So during the course of the week, we'll actually wind up doing six different plays. Wow, okay. And the tech begins. Um, so yeah, that's now that we're moving into a more uh, traditional theatrical space, because outside we were working with, you know, natural light and... Right. And I've been talking about, okay, this has to be a space that can be everything. The yeah. actors have to be able to do absolutely anything. Now, you can decide on maybe a floor treatment. You can decide that you're going to give them, uh, I don't know, the few uh, a few options of certain props or, or set props that they might choose to use, might choose not to use. But we're not going to control how these things get used because that takes away the value of the experience and the experiment. Right. It's almost like um, my... I'm, it's, been, it's been a little... <clears throat> sorry, it's been a little while, so my, my references may be off, but it's a little bit like, you know, performing at Shakespeare's Globe versus... Wasn't it uh, Blackfriars Theatre? He moved yeah. indoors later in his career. Exactly. Yes. Right. So yeah. it's an adjustment for the actors, and then obviously it's an adjustment for you know um, the technical side because obviously you'd like the sun is up, off we go. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's that is interesting. Yeah. I hadn't obviously I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, of course. You know when you there are you know it's not just. You know the 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 creative side going. Hey, let's have fun and let's not rehearse this. And everyone else is involved. Going, well, hang on a minute. Let's slow this yeah. down. Yeah. Um. So what I wanted to ask you was, um, in your experience, are you you? I, I went onto the the unrehearsed Shakespeare website. Couldn't find um a Bard and the Barn website, but you've obviously got experience with some of the Shakespeare's some of Shakespeare's comedies. Mm -hmm. um, from both the the times where you've worked with companies that memorize the lines and times when you when it's the unrehearsed technique. Have you noticed a difference um, other than the, the presence that we spoke about earlier? Um, is there a, have you noticed a difference in the directing? Um, and And has your experience with the unrehearsed then influenced how you direct, memorized, and rehearsed. Yeah, I would say it's definitely influenced it because there are things now that that I see in the text that I feel are indications of something that should happen that I wouldn't have recognized before. Um, I don't always adhere to them because I think that there needs to be it. A difference. I guess I can use it as an inspiration. Yes. But it's not necessarily something that I adhere to 100%. Um, and of course, the the essential idea of anything original practice is you're trying to get as close as you can to replicating some kind of original performance. Right. But that becomes problematic in a lot of ways. Um, for example, if you want, sorry, this is going a little bit afield. No. Feel free to bring it back if I get too far from the subject. That's fine. But you have to make decisions about it. Twelfth Night is a play that has lots of music in it. Shakespeare's audience would have been hearing music that they recognized, tunes that they recognized, and that perhaps that they would sing along with when they watched that play. So now when you're doing an unrehearsed production today of that play, what are you trying to capture? The original music? which makes your contemporary audience feel like they're watching a museum piece? Yes. Or do you want to grab some kind of popular music and put these words to that so that you evoke the spirit in the audience that the original audience would have had? Right. And these kinds of decisions are really very tricky, and they, they change the shape of the whole performance. So I think every play, certainly that I direct, I, I wanted to to have its distinct set of rules and exist in a very specific world. Uh, right now, I'm directing a production of Romeo and Juliet. 
I was, my contract says, well, I guess it isn't spelled out here, but, but my understanding was from the beginning, this is a Romeo and Juliet with a cast of six. The running time is 60 minutes. Okay. So part of my job as director is to cut lots and lots of text out, figure out how to do some creative doubling with the actors. So by the time I've done all of that, there are things about the unrehearsed technique that I sim simply can't bring into play. Yeah. Also, large swaths of the text are gone. So if I'm trying to capture, you know, what originally was this scene meant to do? Well, all kinds of stuff that it doesn't have time to do now. Right. So, uh, right. But I, I am influenced by it, certainly. Really aware, especially for me, one of the really profound things is that only thou and you comes up. Sorry, you, you, sorry, Bill, you, f you froze up slightly there. Um, um, could you just repeat that? Uh, I've got a, unfortunately, I've got a bit of a poor connection here, but um, no if you could yeah. just repeat that last point there. One of the things that I find particularly influential is the switching back and forth between thou and you, because yeah. that's a very big deal in unrehearsed Shakespeare. And when I see it, in a text that I'm working on in a rehearsed context, I'm really conscious of what that means, the implications of that. Even if we're rehearsing it, yes. I find it to be an important trigger to do something. Uh, I don't think I would have looked at that, well, I know I wouldn't have looked at that the same way before experiencing the rehearsed. Yeah. It really changed my perspective in that way. Right. I should mention, too, on a non-Shakespearean front, that yeah. uh, I'm so intrigued by the spontaneity of this, that a couple times I've worked with a version of this technique for contemporary plays, or more modern plays, and uh, just to try to inspire that same spontaneity. Uh, when, when I directed Long Day's Journey and Tonight at the university a number of years ago, I gave everybody a script that contained only their own lines and no cue lines. So okay. they had their text and then there would be a blank space and then they have their next speech. And whenever they heard something that they thought sounded it might be what inspired their next they proceed to their next line. Um, Interesting. It was, really, it was very valuable. I don't think you could do it with every cast and in every context, but the people I was working with in that show, it was magical. There was some wonderful, unexpected overlap and competitiveness and long pregnant silences when we were working that way that really evoked something about that particular family atmosphere, people talking huh. over each other or, or nobody knowing what to say, uh, that really helped us capture something that became crucial to our specific production of the play. Right. Interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. So I, I've got to ask, I was uh, writing a couple of things down as they were coming to me. Um, just, you, you reference, you know, obviously, if you're trying to capture the original practices of how it was then, are we also looking at doing, you know, uh, Elizabethan, Shakespearean, dress or are we looking at modern dress what do you or yeah. is that not really that much of a concern for you well this is another place where sort of like what i referenced in the music uh yeah you have a sort of directorial or editorial intervention that comes here you make a decision about how that's going to work when we first when we had when the grant money was flowing freely for bard in the barn <laughs> we had a great situation where we were able to do everything with Elizabethan costumes. Right. Um, that was really exciting. We were pulling them almost exclusively from stock, but, uh, but we had a large stock to work with and we could make okay. some small modifications. And there are certainly places in the plays where you want that. Um, Cassius talks about walking outside with his doublet all unbraced. Well, what does that mean if you're wearing a t-shirt? Right. 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 That really changes that. So when possible, we want to get that that same energy going. But there are limits to it as well. Well, OK. And a great thing is if you if you have uh, a comic role or a role that is to a great extent comic, 
let's say yeah. the nurse in Romeo and Juliet. Right. Um, you put a man in that role and put him in an Elizabethan dress. Yeah. And halfway to the comedy threshold already, right? Right. Um, but if you follow that through too much and you want to get too original practicing with that, then all of a sudden you're excluding all women yes. from your own company, which is not something that we're interested in doing either. Right. So uh, it, it seems that the more you try to get close to original practice, uh, the more you find ways in which you are not willing to do it. Like, for example, excluding women. Right. Um, my favorites, <clears throat> in terms of the look of what we've done, have been the ones we did with Elizabethan costumes. Mm -hmm. um, but when we've had less access to those, we've let people pull things from their closet that seem appropriate to them, and you still get a sense of it. You have elements of it. Um, my very favorite unrehearsed would be with period costumes outside. Um, yeah, but then, see, when it comes to the music, I still don't know. We did a Twelfth Night once that was so uh, so beautifully received, and we started the show by asking the audience. I always do telling the audience parameters and what you are permitted to do because they are permitted to behave like an Elizabethan audience, which means less formality from them. And then at the end of that, I asked the audience for suggestions about what romantic song we might use to start the show because the Orsino enters saying if music be, there's music and Orsino enters saying right. if music be, there's food of love play on, right? Yeah. And, um, so we got nominations, and then the audience got to vote on what romantic song they wanted to use, and they chose the Titanic theme. Okay. Right? So then our source of the music was, I told the audience to start singing the Titanic theme, and ah. they all started singing it together, and Orsino came in, told them to play on, and then he says, you know, enough, no more. It's not so sweet now as it was before, and he shut them up. Um, so they they understood from the beginning how participatory this could be. Yeah. And, and that was really wonderful. And there's, you can't do that with a piece of music from 1598. Right. Right. Spirit. So, yeah. Interesting. And it's, um, hang on. When I, I was in a production of, uh, Romeo and Juliet many years ago. And, you know, I, I think I can't remember the whether it was um, it was first folio or if it was a combination, but there was a well, there was a show that we did um, where we had high school students in, and they they behave more like my understanding of how an Elizabethan audience was, yeah. Yeah. Um, because you know they don't know they're used to TV or whatever it was, <clears throat> and. You know, you, you do all the you have these wonderful lines as an actor, you know, but soft what light through yonder window breaks and all that sort of stuff. And it's just words to a degree. But then we get an audience like that, and then you realize the scene prior was a really rowdy scene with Mercutio and Benvolio, and yeah. I think Romeo was in that as well. It's a really rowdy scene. It, it, it riled up the audience. <clears throat> but then we go to the romantic scene, he sees her on the balcony. But the audience, you know, hasn't switched. Right. The audience is still in the, the energy of the previous scene. They're still loud. You've now got to do the quiet scene. What are you going to do? You've got one line, but soft. Yeah. And, yes. and it, was, it was, I was able to, I can't remember the, the staging because it was 18 years ago now. Um, but I remember, you know, Romeo using that line, but soft. And everybody silenced. And yeah. then he was able to, you know, switch. And it was in that moment, all those years ago, I was like, oh, you know, the, the text is a lot more practical often than what we give it credit for. Absolutely. You know, we, you know, we sometimes, you know, when you're away from these original practices, we sometimes, you know, look at this beautiful, poetic, flowery language. But a lot of the time it was really practical. You know, there was a lot of practicality to it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think... And I think, you know, to your point, you know, using that, you, you know, using an audience in that way or having an audience like that 
you get to then see you know and experience how how useful that text can be mm-hmm. um that's really interesting uh is that the uh, and i just i just this is this is uh uh i've got a couple of tangents so i want to go on if that's okay um and that <laughs> it's it's less of a question more of a statement um <laughs> Do you, you you were mentioning the nurse, um, the you know uh, a production of the nurse where you had a, a man dressed as a nurse and an Elizabethan dress, you know, sort of taking it towards the comedy. Um, I was just wondering; it, re- it reminded me. Do you know much about the the British theatre tradition of pantomime? I know a lot about it. I would say I know more than an American layman. And less than someone who has been to see British pantomime performances. Okay. How's that? Okay. Um, so uh, apologies if I if I Brit explained to you. Um, no, no. But for the just for the sake of this, um, they're traditionally um, we they 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 use myths. Um, you know, uh, urban. You know, not really urbans, but more mythology. So we're looking at. Um, you know, traditional fairy tales, um, you know, things like Hansel and Gretel, Cinderella, Snow White, that sort of thing. And traditionally speaking, the the lead male character is, sorry, the lead female character is often played by a male. So if it's, mm-hmm. if you're looking at something like Robin Hood, Robin Hood is played by a woman. And then there is frequently a mother character involved or like a uh, a mother character who is which is often played by a, an older man, uh, mm-hmm. preferably without facial hair, um, and that adds part to the comedy as well. I mean, there are obviously you know in the in the in the age that we live in, you you know we're we're looking at all this sort of tradition now through a completely different lens, um, yeah. but looking at the 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 lens of how it has been from I don't know hundred years or so up until now, you know, um, my understanding is that the, the man wouldn't be attempting to be a successful, you know, female performance. It would be, you know, woman, you know, the female role plus man, and the man would be failing to achieve the part of the comedy was failing to achieve a convincing female character, you know, and, and others, and they, you know, and they're very specific about drawing a distinction between drag and pantomime. That is called a pantomime dame is the name of the role. Um, okay. You know, from from my experience and um, from my my learning, is that the is drag involves a lot more glitter, um, mm-hmm. and there's no sort of glitter involved in in pantomime dame. And I, I think that you know there's a lot more success involved with doing the you know of a male performer performing drag, there's a lot more, you know, they're a- attempting to achieve a success in that. Whereas the, the actor playing the dame role isn't attempting to achieve a, su- a successful portrayal of a woman, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. And I, yeah. I bring that up because there is some suggestion. Um, I don't think there's uh, agreement among scholars, but there is some suggestion that the, the nurse was almost like a proto pantomime dame. Mm-hmm. So it would have been like you know a comic actor, maybe not ne- maybe not Will Kemp, but someone of that ilk, you know yeah. that playing that that motherly role, um, which you know and and it, you know whether that was true or not, a lot of those a lot of the uh, pantomime dame roles that came over that you know over the last sort of Victorian era till now, it seemed to, you know, be modeled after that, you know, yeah, it's quite interesting. And it, uh, and, uh, and uh, not, not, not to plug myself too much, but, I, <laughs> but just briefly, I, I did a, a, a one man show some years ago, about four or four, five years ago now um, called Shakespeare's Fools. And the premise behind it was that Will Kemp didn't die uh, of the plague what happened, he fell out with Shakespeare and then he went on a farewell tour of the Americas. And, oh, yeah. and, it, and it essentially became a, an evening with Will Kemp. 
So he would regale, mm -hmm. um, you know, stories uh, and then perform his favorite roles that he was able to do. Um, and then I, but, <laughs> but because of my knowledge of, you know, the pantomime dame and the possibility of it, you know, being born in the nurse, I thought I, I, I allowed him, <laughs> I allowed him the, the, the privilege, if you like, um, to be able to, you know, do that part. This is a part that I wanted to play and I wasn't able yeah. to play, but here's my version of it. So yeah. it, it was kind of, a, it was kind of a fun thing to do with that, you know, with that, you know, knowledge in mind, yeah, sure. you know, with the connection of the audience as well. Um, just to bring it back to, to Shakespeare a little bit more about what we were talking about. Um, a question that came up recently and I didn't, I wasn't sure whether to ask you this question or not. Um, so I, I'm sort of putting you on the spot a little bit here. So apologies for that. Do you know, um, much about the work of the original pronunciation movement? Oh yeah. You know what? My knowledge is somewhat limited. I've seen a few, um, uh, YouTube videos and so forth. Right. And I own the, uh, the pronouncing dictionary. I don't remember the title of it, but I, I own the original pronunciation dictionary. Uh, I even reference it a couple times in my book because I think there are things, um, uh, just anytime you're working with any branch of original practice, I think it's really good idea to acknowledge the other branches that exist. Yes, right? and, to, yes. and one of my goals with the book is to stimulate people to think not only about specifically what we do in the 21st century with unrehearsed, but think, well, what are we doing? And, and so I bring up a few times, I point out that, uh, for example, puns that don't work anymore because the yes. pronunciation has changed, but that feed into the fabric of the whole, uh, of a whole speech, something like that. I do reference it. I haven't had the opportunity to see any uh, full productions done with original pronunciation. I'm interested in that. I would like to see that sometime, yeah. but not something that I've seen and not something that I've worked with extensively. There's a company um, in Elgin, actually, that uh, the guy there, uh, Sean Hargadon, is uh, interest, very interested in a lot of original practice ideas. And he brought me up, I've been up there a couple times to work with actors on Oh, hang on. Froze again. Oh, no. Here, unrehearsed. Okay. Next year, do a couple of productions with original pronunciation. So he's playing with those kinds of ideas. And I'm, I'm thinking perhaps I'll have the chance to come up and see one of his original pronunciation. Uh, I, I don't know for sure. Right. But yeah, I'm intrigued by it because some of it is so... Uh, yeah, some of it is really wonderful. Some of yeah. the limited stuff that I know about it. Um, yeah. I'll tell you one, because I'm working with Romeo and Juliet right now, one that, that intrigues me, um, and I looked it up to see if his book gave me any help. Uh, there is one case where, th there are definitely cases where child rhymes with wild. Okay. But there is at least one case in shape, well, one case, according to Crystal, there is one case where child rhymes with spilled. And it's in Romeo and Juliet, okay. which is why I was looking it up, because I became aware this whole scene is written in rhyming, this whole section of the scene is written in rhyming couplets. But child rhymes with spilled. And I thought, oh, I wonder if actually they used to say chilled. Mm. But I looked it up. And there are several places where it's actually pronounced child. So this intrigues me, and I start to question, okay, what does this mean? Does this mean that, was it enough of a dialect thing where either was acceptable? When you, well, and I just used one of those words, right? Either. We hear someone say either or either. Yeah. It will pronounce Was child and chilled like that? Or were the Elizabethans attuned enough to language that if a playwright wished to create a rhyme that didn't really exist and chose to say chilled, that they still heard the word having the meaning of child, but accepted the rhyme. And, and I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. Maybe Ben Chris 
because child. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that intrigues me. Yeah, um, that last little section froze up a little bit there. You were referencing uh, Crystal, which was it David or Ben were you referring to there? Ah, that's such a good question because I was avoiding saying the first name to make sure I didn't get it wrong. I, I think the dictionary, the pronouncing dictionary, I think that's Ben Crystal. Okay, because I know, yeah, my, under, my understanding, I haven't, uh, I, I don't know them, um, only through some YouTube videos the David, Dave, my understanding is David is the, David is the father, Ben is his son, um, and I've seen them do work together, yes. um, and I think there's also a, yes. I think there's also a book um, by Paul Mayer, is it, Meyer? I'm not certain about that, I'll have to, I'll have to check that, there's a, the, another, per, there's a third, Mayer, my child, child, yeah. <laughs> right, there's a, yeah, there's a third person there as well. Um, okay, that's really interesting. And what was the name of that book? Can you remember? No. Uh, it's, it's something like a dictionary of original pronunciation or something. Um, I'll look it up and I'll, 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 I'll uh, reference it somewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I, I asked because I thought, you know, with you know your original practices, I, I wondered what it would look like you know, with the with the the unrehearsed technique plus the original pronunciation, I I, I was intrigued by that. You know, if I uh, my intention to go off on a purely personal note, I don't know how much of this, you know, how much of this I've communicated to Melissa, how much you know, uh, perhaps via Facebook or whatever. But, um, my husband lives in Indianapolis or right outside of Indianapolis. Okay, and I work 250 miles away from there, so it's. And now my residence is with him, and I rent a room in a boarding house in the. Uh, this is something that I've been doing for quite a few years, and time for it to stop. So uh, I'm looking to retire after next year oh. from my academic position. I, I still want to, you know, I still intend to do work and freelance and so forth, but I'm retiring from the university. Uh, if I were, and, and not because I don't like my job, but because personally, I'm just I'm done with that. Commute. Yeah, it's a, it's a hell of a distance. Yeah. So uh, if I were going to, if my career at the university was going to last longer, I would most certainly be looking into exactly what you're talking about. The next step for me would be to see if I could, like, maybe offer special topics in a and do an unrehearsed with original pronunciation, maybe do a main introduction with original pronunciation. Uh, because it is, it's the part of the rather large arc of cutting edge of what's being done with Shakespeare now. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be aware of it. I want my students to be aware of it. Um, yeah. But that, that kind of thing, you know, we've already planned next year's season at the university is already set in stone. For example, we plan far enough in advance that, you know, if I'm really going to make moves in that direction at the university, it happens slowly. It evolves over a period of years. So I'm not going to be there long enough to see it happen. But maybe I'll have opportunities to to do it on my own in some other context. Right, right. Interesting. Um, and just sort of getting towards the end now, um, I wanted to ask you, I, this is a question I've, I ask uh, pretty much everyone I've interviewed. Um, knowing what you know about uh, Shakespeare and his comedies. Um, are there any lessons? I mean, whether it's you know whether we're looking at the rehearsed or the unrehearsed, are there are there any lessons that you feel that modern comedy or modern comedians could still learn from him, or do you think those lessons have all been learned? It's a great question. I think. I feel like, actually, to, to turn the question on its, on its head a little bit, okay. I feel like more often I find with my college-age students that I'm having to point out to them, look, Shakespeare's asking you to do the kind of thing here 
that the comedians you like do all the time. Right. We we want to move your away in some kind of time capsule, and they well, you know, I, I also think many of my students don't understand the difference between Elizabethan England and Victorian England because everything that is, say, pre their grandparents is stodgy and sexually uptight or something, you know, which which is the legacy of the Victorian era. Right. Interesting their thinking. When Victorianism was a reaction to something, right? And it was the the licentiousness, maybe even, of of previous eras, right? So yeah. Shakespeare is all about the dirty jokes. Yeah. Yes, Oscar Wilde couldn't be, but Shakespeare was because it predates that. So it's it's getting the students to realize this isn't some kind of museum piece, stuffy, cold, um, in the in the words of Peter Schaefer, well, to shape Peter Schaefer's words, uh, marble shitting Shakespeare, to, you know, reference to Amadeus. Right. When most he doesn't want to write operas about people who sound like they shit marble, to get my students to understand, those these people were making the same kinds of jokes. Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. We keep going to that, but they, you know, teenage boys, locker room talk. It's locker room talk from the 1590s that is yeah. comparable to locker room talk of today. So I think that comedians of today have have a lot in common with Shakespeare. Do they right. have something to learn? Um, perhaps in many cases, profundity. I mean, I think there are profound. Tragedies have moments of comedy in them and the comedies often have some, not only great language and funny situations, but they'll have something interesting to say. And I wish that all people's art comic or otherwise, uh, theatrical or otherwise, wasn't just for consumption, but also was trying to make a point. And I'm not sure everybody always is. I think we seem to be in a time where getting to the top is what's important, not having something to say. Right. And I, I do think Shakespeare always had something to say. Yeah. Right. And, you know, just... Just briefly, it sort of saddens me any time I hear about, you know, Shakespeare being removed from, you know, school curriculums or, you know, whatever period of school, whether it's middle school, high school or etc. You know, I always just think, you know, why? You know, uh, when I was when I was in college, we were we were rehearsing a production of um, uh, we were doing a restoration piece. Um, it was the. Uh, the Bow Defeated. It was by one of the few female playwrights of the Restoration. And our director, you know, mentioned at the time, I, you know, I can't remember her exact words, but she was essentially saying she doesn't know how she feels that, you know, Shakespeare's plays and, you know, to a, to a degree, the plays of the Restoration still, you know, still reflect our times now or still are relevant today just in terms of the the actions that people take, the emotions that people have. I mean, everything sort of, you know, um, around us has changed. The way we communicate has changed. You know, you know, computers have changed and things, and we're on the moon and all this. But basically, we're still, this, you know, we're still the same people. Now, she didn't know whether she felt that was a good thing or a bad thing, you know, and... Yeah. You know, just with that in mind, you know, every time I hear people saying, well, Shakespeare is terrible, it's not relatable, it's all this dead language. But it's like, if we can, if the tools and techniques were taught either to the teachers and then from the teachers to the students as a way to unlock the language, you'll see that we're still the same people. Mm -hmm. We're still jealous and, you know, we have these, you know, angry and full of joy and love and passion those you know everything is still it's still the same i'm reading a book right now which is not a not a particularly scholarly book it's a very user-friendly kind of book about this but about um what do they call it uh evolutionary psychology okay and one of the things they talk about in it is uh they reference it as the savannah principle which is that 
humans evolve so slowly. Life evolution is very, very slow compared to the evolution of animals that have a much shorter life cycle than we and reproduce younger. So uh, our minds haven't evolved yet to reflect any of the advances of, I don't even know how long they say, but like, you know, of, of a couple of millennia. So right. the savanna principle is we still respond to things as though we were living on a savanna. Right. Our mind, although we grasp the idea that somebody on television is not present with us, yes. the part of us that hasn't evolved to understand that, and we only relate to people in two ways, the savanna principle says. Friend or enemy. Someone who is not trying to kill you is your friend. That's the Savannah Principle. So therefore, everyone we see on television is our friend. Interesting. They are not presenting a threat to us. That's only one of many examples they give, but yeah. I, I'm intrigued by it. And the, I think my biggest takeaway from the book overall has been this idea that humans are not capable because of our life cycle and our reproductive age. We're not capable of evolving quickly. So we right. don't on a profound level, understand these changes around I would say, you know, we don't, we don't really grasp computers. Right. We don't really grasp communication with people over a great distance. Right. These are things we're capable of dealing with. It's right. really intriguing. Yeah, yeah. You were, you were reminding me, when you were talking about seeing people on television, you reminded me that sometimes you get people, they watch the, you know, their, their regular TV shows like your soap operas and then you know the the character that they see is the same as the the actor playing the part. Yes. And they yep. they conflate the two together. So when so if they run into that actor in real life, they're like, you know, what you were saying to such and such, I you know you were wrong. And it was like, well, hang on a minute, this is just a show. I'm not really yeah. that person. And it's like you're really mean. And it's like no no, <laughs> you know. And it's, it's interesting that you say that because I you know that's something I'm reminded of. Yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't often hear it now, but I, I did for a, you know, for a period, people conflate the two, and, you know, you sometimes an actor's walking down the street and they shouting at the abuse at the actor because they're, you know, uh, uh, playing a bad guy on TV or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah. It's like, well, hang on. Yeah. Um, okay, that's that's really interesting. That's great. A lot more, prof you you think a lot more profundity and a lot, you know, having, you know, more of a point. For, for modern comedy. Yeah, and and maybe I'm maybe I'm selling modern comedy short. I don't. Maybe I don't see enough of it to have a okay really strong opinion. But it does seem to me like yeah, like some people get to the well, you know, okay. It's not that it wasn't around then, right? was really not interested in profundity. But he was working in Shakespeare's plays on text that had a profound underpinning. So, Sorry, who was that? You, you froze up slightly. Will Kemp. Will Kemp, Will, okay. Yeah. Um, so it's not as though comedians who just want to clown and get the laughs are anything new, because they probably have existed as long as as long as there was language, maybe even before, right? But, right. Uh, but I'm, I'm always less interested in those people unless they exist in a context. Yeah, I find that hard to articulate. But um, right. Interesting. Um, but then I, I guess. Not that I want to get in too much of a debate back and forth about this, but it's just something I'm obviously I'm intrigued by. Um, do you do you not feel then there's a place for just escapist art where people can sort of you know because there's so much like now there's so much news happening you know globally lots of different things that everyone yeah. sort of switches on the news and you think everything's really bad. Yes. You know, I just want, I don't want to then go to the theater, go to a movie, go to a comedy show or what have you, and then have that reflected back to me all the time. 
Absolutely. So I, you know, I actually have a couple thoughts about that. One of them is that I think uh, we can, we could see entertainment that we might think of as escapist in that it does not deal with politics or global warming or some of these issues that press down on us, right? Yeah. But has something profound to say about the relationships between mothers and their sons. Right. That's a different kind of profundity, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. We have comedy about mothers and sons that reveals a deeper truth about mothers and sons that is both escapist and has some kind of significant thought behind it. I think... I'm with you, yeah. The the thing that concerns me more is trying to identify, okay, well, that's entertainment, and how can I put myself up and do that thing so that I get a lot of attention, regardless of what I have to say. Right. It's about attention. It's about my Twitter followers. It's not about. And now you know, New York is buying into this, and and. Part of the basis of casting decisions is how many Twitter followers a given actor yeah. has, yeah. because then that will attract an audience. You know, it, it's got to be somewhere. Something has got to be about more than economic self-interest. Right. Yeah. But yeah, and but- he's a successful businessman, so it's not like he didn't get that. But two tracks were running there. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, because that that is a part of it now, isn't it? You know, how many Twitter followers do you have? That may almost makes you less of a person, or 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 you know maybe less of a performer if you have a small number versus a large number. It's like, well, hang on, you know, I I know people who aren't on social media. It doesn't make mm-hmm. them, you know, it doesn't make them less of a person or less of a performer, right? Right. Um, yeah, my you know I'm on I'm on Twitter, but I. I'm, I don't often use it, so I have a, a low, a low a subscriber count right now, and it's like okay, but it's not anything I'm I'm concerned about. Yes, you know, I it goes up, it goes down, it goes up. You know, it's like okay, it doesn't sort of impact. It doesn't really impact. Maybe it should. I don't know, but it doesn't really impact me on a day to day basis. You know, it doesn't. You know, uh, alter my worth. You know, if I was to do, you know, if I was to put on a show. I might start thinking differently about that, you yeah. know, because you want to market and you want to reach people. Um, well, you know, I had a student tell me, a very astute student, mm-hmm. he went, uh, starting to work on the book, that I really needed to get a Twitter account because it would, it would help in promoting the book. And I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I thought, you know what, no, I, especially my goal is with the book aren't to, uh, to, yeah, to, to put notches on my bedpost about how many people know about it and how large a, a following I have it. Yeah. Quite frankly, the royalties on it, I get $4 a copy. Right. So it's not, I mean, it's never going to be Harry Potter, right? I'm not going to, this is not my retirement nest egg. Right. Uh, it's not... For me, it isn't worth wading into because I'm not interested in Twitter. I have a Facebook account, and that's enough for me, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's and right. I understand. You know, th- this is a 20 year old person who's ambitious and needs to look for what was going to be working in her career. Right. I'm on the other end of that. I don't need right. it. Right, and you know, I mean, I'm I'm on Twitter. I was on it for a period, and then I left some years ago, and then I came back. Um, you know, and it's, it's fine because, you know, to, to a degree, it, it, I find it odd because to, to, to a degree, I feel like I'm just sort of, you know, metaphorically standing there talking, waiting for someone to talk to me. So I either mm-hmm. I'm talking or, you know, and then if I'm talking then someone might be arguing with me, it's like, you know, I don't really want an argument or, <laughs> you know, I don't want to, I don't want to maybe have a conversation with the people I will get to know people, meet new people. I don't want to just go right, you know, person I've never met before. Let's have an argument. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to spend my time doing that, you know, yeah. meeting yeah. new people like yourself, having a conversation, you know, about areas that we're interested in rather than going, well, actually, Bill, you know, you mentioned that, but I think you're wrong. It's like, what? No, 
we don't why do we need to get into that you know it's just it just doesn't make any sense so you know what i what i how i use it is i i try to just i see other people talking and i try to chip in if they ask a question i try to answer it and i just try to engage people and have conversations you know rather than and you know i don't know if that's right or wrong but it's it's kind of how i do it and you know i'm not i i i do have that i suppose i better go and check twitter reaction Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. um so you you've mentioned a couple of times about a book you've written a book or is it or you're still writing it no, it's, it's written. Yep. What's the, what's the title? It is called uh, Perform Your Unrehearsed. Wow. Oh. Just subtitle. Perform Shakespeare Unrehearsed, A Practical Guide to Acting and Producing Spontaneous Shakespeare. Performing Shakespeare Unrehearsed. Practical Guide. Nice. And... Do you have a website for it? I don't. Uh, it's because I haven't bothered to put up my own because Routledge, which published it, oh. has... Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Right. I, I'm sorry I missed, I missed the Routledge part. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's great. Yeah. And it's on... So if I went to the Routledge website, it's on there. It's on Amazon. Yeah, all the all the usual places. places. Got yeah. it. Nice, nice. And when when did you when did you publish that? Last March came out at the end of last March. Oh wow, great! Wow, that's brilliant. I'm gonna have to look at that. It was my sabbatical oh. project. Okay. And you know, interesting too, because I've never I've not done anything like that before, and I thought it was going to be enormously time consuming. And I think there's probably only one book in me, and that was it. Okay. Uh, But I've been working so long with this, you know, more than 10 years, teaching lots of workshops and doing lots of productions, that writing the book was much easier than I thought. I structured it exactly the way that my workshops are structured, with a couple small exceptions. And so... I didn't need to create an outline because the outline has evolved out of the number of workshops I've done. Yeah. It was like a workshop where I never had to stop talking. You know, I could give more examples and, uh, and go into more detail about some of the things that we need to just generalize in a workshop. So the writing of the book happened very, very fast. I was amazed. Well, partly also because I, I couldn't seem to stop. I would, I told myself, that I would write at least an hour a day. I thought I needed that amount of discipline. And frequently, I wouldn't be willing to stop. And I'd write for three and a half hours, four hours. I'd be staying up late at night because I wanted to get more done. Yeah. And so suddenly I found myself approaching the end of the first draft of the book. And actually, my sabbatical hadn't even started yet. It was still summer. Oh, wow. Um, because... I've been so worried that I wouldn't be able to write it within yeah. the allotted time. Yes. That I started in March. Yeah. It kept going and going. And, you know, a year, almost to the day, a year from when I started writing it, it was in print. Wow. Which is ridiculously fast. But, and yeah. as I say, I think were I to try to write something else, it would take me years. Yeah. yeah. It's just that, well, my mother said, you know, well, you've, you've been writing this book for 10 years. Yeah. You know, in right. terms of journey that and everything so. yeah and was this I, I don't mean to pry too much but was this yeah. essentially uh you you pitched this to Routledge before you started writing it yes I uh my well two people mainly my mother and my husband had been saying to me for a while there needs to be a book there needs to be a book and uh and even at some point someone said if you don't write this book, somebody else is going to. Right. I thought, well, that's certainly true. So, uh, so then I applied for the sabbatical. Uh, I lost my train of thought. Your original question was. Um, I was just asking you about uh, about the book and if you pitched the idea of a book to Routledge before you started writing oh, it. Right. 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 
So then I applied for my sabbatical, uh, my sabbatical application to the university. My proposed project was I would write this book. And uh, was granted the sabbatical and then was at the Southeast Theater Conference and chatting with a friend and told her that I had sabbatical coming up. And I said, but you know, I know I can write the book. What I don't know anything about is, you know, how to get it to a publisher. I don't, I don't even know how that works. Right. And she said, oh, did you know that representatives of Routledge are here? <laughs> and I'm acquainted with one of them. So I walked, you know, I don't know, four rows and two booths over at SCTC, and there was a representative from Routledge. And as it happened, it's actually great because I, I, my friend presented me and said, you know, this is Bill Kincaid. He's... Uh, has a, a book at the end, the woman read it. I said, oh yeah, well, what is that? And uh, I gave her a sort of 30-second synopsis of what I wanted to write, and from behind me came a voice, you should really publish this man's work. He taught me everything I know about Shakespeare. And I turned around, and it was a former student of mine who already had a publishing contract with Rob Lynch. Oh, Wow book, which hasn't come out yet, by the way. But uh, so he knew this woman personally. He happened to be right there and vouched for me in the moment. Now, of course, I still had to go through the process of writing an official proposal for the book, uh, writing a chapter that got reviewed by some experts in the field and, and that kind of thing. But yes, uh, so there was there was that typical process, but it was really pretty simple. The way wow. that it turned out, simpler yeah. than than it might have been. I don't. I would have had to go through the process of. I mean, I know Routledge is a great company, right? But yeah, uh, I would have felt that I needed to research what companies might be good for it and blah blah. There just would have been a whole process that I sort yeah. of skipped over. Yeah, that's good. So the so in terms of so there's your book performing Shakespeare unrehearsed, and but there's also one. That was published 75 years ago, you were referencing, right? Oh, no, that's the. Sorry, you froze up on me a little bit there. That, we would, I, 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 didn't get, I didn't get your reply, unfortunately, sorry. Um, it was, we, were, we were referencing acting from Shakespeare's first folio book. Right, and that was probably published around 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, his research, the, the beginning of uh, the inquiry, traced it back to some work that was done 75 years ago. Right. But Don Weinberg's actual book talking about the history and the evolution of the technique, uh, that was published probably around 12 years ago, I'm Go guessing. Um, also by Routledge, by the way, which was huh. kind of a cool in, and he wound up being one of the reviewers for oh. my proposal, which I was pleased about. And then there's a book called Secrets of Acting Shakespeare by Patrick Tucker. Okay. That one, it's so hard to guess years now without it in front of me. 25 years ago, okay. maybe? And uh, he was the first one to really start putting some of these things down on paper, but his, honestly, he's much less prescriptive than my book is, uh, and less specific than that in a lot of ways. But, I mean, there's a, certainly a huge debt of gratitude there because he's yes. the one who really got the ball rolling. But one thing that I say, and certainly different practitioners of original practice stuff feel very differently about this. In many cases, I say, look, do not question. Do not try to justify what the language is making you do here. Let the audience fill in the gaps. You do what the language says. It's not about an actor having an interpretation of the role. It's about an actor executing the instructions that the language is given, giving them. And right. it's a different way of looking at things, and it's not a very 21st century way of looking at things. It's right. not a very Stanislavski way of looking at things. Right. But my... Yeah, but, but it, it is my perspective on how to work with unrehearsed. You do it. 
let the audience figure out their interpretation. It's not us. It's them. Right. Um, it's very easy in an unrehearsed production of a play that you don't know well. It's very easy to get lost and not have any idea what's going on in the plot. Yeah. And that's unusual for us. We want to sit around and have a why did Masha first have these feelings for Constantine or whatever? We, we want to spend a lot of time delving into that and have our own emotional connection to it. Yeah. Rehearse Shakespeare demands the opposite. You don't have to know a thing about Hotspur and Lady Percy's uh, love for one another. What you have to do is go to her, you say that, and create some distance when you say you. The audience sees that constant physical dynamic between you and puts their own understanding on it of what it means for two young, passionate married people to be close to one another or far away from one another while they're having an argument. Right. That's up to them. Got it. That's my take in my book. Patrick Tucker's, I think, is very, very different from that. But as I say, huge debt of gratitude. Yes. And he also does something that I specifically shied away from, which is he tries to make the argument, this is how the Elizabethans did it. Okay. And I allow him to make that argument, and I say, regardless of how the Elizabethans did it, this is really cool, it's a lot of fun, yeah. and it will teach you to look more closely at what is written for you. Right. From from alternate spellings to punctuation to use of pronouns. And it, are there any over, overlaps with um, John Barton's playing Shakespeare? You know, it's, it, it, in, just in terms of, you know, the, the, the clues and the ways into the text that he refers to. I would say that this is a more mechanical uh, version of some of that because he's still trying to from what I recall, I haven't watched it recently but like yeah. his real goal still has to do with finding a way into emotional truth right, yes, yeah, that's fair to say yeah, I um, think so it's been a while and, for me as well yeah, and I performing Shakespeare unrehearsed in my way has nothing to do with emotional truth. If there's any emotional truth going on, it's going to be happening out in the audience. Right. We're executing something and the audience is, the audience is having the emotional experience and we are not. Right. Um, but although there are emotional experiences that are spontaneous, yes. we did measure for measure, um, in measure for measure, uh, Claudio is condemned to be executed okay. uh, by having his head cut off. But then there's this, uh, what, the, the, this plot hatched. Plot is such a lame word. Um, they figure out how to avoid executing Claudio because they're going to substitute the decapitated head of another prisoner, right? Okay. But they give out the news that Claudio has been executed. His head has been cut off. Well, so Isabella, who is Claudio's sister, hears only that Claudio has been executed. And then in Act 5, when he shows up and he's alive, it's a complete surprise to her. Okay, so you do measure for measure unrehearsed. You cast two people who are good friends as Claudio and Isabella. She has to, at one point, tell him, your life is worth less to me than my virginity. And then in a later scene, she's been off stage. She hasn't heard all the, all the dialogue that went between. In a later scene, she's told, he has been executed. So the actor, who, by the way, I took care to cast someone who had never read the play, the actor believes that that has happened in the plot of the play. So in Act 5, when Claudio shows up alive, it's a parallel emotional experience for the actor to the emotional experience of Isabella yes. because she thinks he's dead. Yeah. And her response to that is emotional 
and spontaneous. Yeah. Uh, so there's emotion to it, but she didn't plan it. A rehearsed production yeah. measure. Yeah. Here, the actor is worried about, okay, how do I create the illusion of the first time here and yes. pretend that I don't have this information? Yeah. She didn't have it. Right. And, and she did begin to cry at that moment. She happens to be a really emotionally accessible person. Yeah. To, which helps, right? But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, things like that are, are a really exciting outgrowth of this. Yeah. Because, you know, an audience then, you know, the, the performance is, <laughs> I'm sorry, that you're just watching the performance are like a blank slate. And then it's what the audience is bringing to that, right? Yeah. 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 Rather than the, the actors worrying about, oh, I, I cried last night and now we're doing the thing again. I don't know. I'm worried. Do I'll, hopefully I'll, I'll cry again tonight. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it's really, really, really interesting. Love all this stuff. It's great. Um, okay, I think that's basically it. We've we've we referenced your book, performing Shakespeare unrehearsed, uh, which is on uh, the Routledge website or Amazon and all good bookstores. Yes. Um, yes. You don't have a website, right? No. And nope. what about Bard in the Barn? Does that have one? You know, I was surprised when you said you didn't find one because I would have thought there. I would have thought that the university web pages about it are still up and would come up in a Google search, but maybe they, maybe they don't. Yeah, I mean, all I could find, I think, was a like a Facebook page for it. I think mm -hmm. I could certainly have another search for it. Well, and you know, you remind me of something that probably is very important. That uh, now that I'm retiring from the university, I probably need to have a website. So that when people search for me, they don't just go to my, you know, there's my profile page on the university. Yeah. You know, you can find me, et cetera. And I probably need something more than that as I, as I move into my academic retirement. Right. Right. Okay, great. Well, that, Bill, this has been, you know, tremendous. I, everything, yeah. uh, I'm sort of, like I was saying to you earlier on, I, I, everything's because this is like your open Pandora's box for me. Um, so, uh, you know, hence there is a lot more stuttering and a lot more thinking things through. Um, yeah, I mean, the, I, the, I, I, I'm glad I have this information now or I'm aware of this information. But, you know, I also wish I would have had it sooner. Obviously not through a fault yeah. of your own. I'm talking about when I was in high school or, yeah. you know, th this... You know, it, it's like you having having being given a car, not being told how to drive it, and then not being given the keys. But here's yeah. the car; it looks nice, but you know, and I can't I can't go anywhere with it. So I've just got, and then I'm given thirty six other you know thirty six other cars. I've got all of these cars, yeah. but no one's given me the tools yep. or the you know the the knowledge about how to access and drive these vehicles and you know and i and it's great now that you know i know this is out there and hopefully if anyone watches or listens to this you know and it's always been a bit you know ah oh, shakespeare you know you know there are tools there are techniques there are roadmaps out there or at least people tell you how to read the roadmaps i should say yeah that's great well, and I, for my unrehearsed class this semester i even and i hope this has a backfire on me i don't think it will uh, I have nine graduate students in it who obviously know their way around. A bit. Right. But I also have some freshmen because I said, look, I don't want any prerequisites on this class. I think there are going to be people who come in who have a relationship to the language, and there will also be people whose only lifeline is what I'm saying to them. And we'll see those people, th their energies colliding in projects. Yeah in the classroom and we'll see what that's like. I think it's going to be really great because there will be people coming at it from more of your place and yes. there will be people who are having one of their first experiences with Shakespeare. So yeah, that's great. We shall see. Yeah. Well, good luck with it. Uh, well, I should, sorry, I should say break a leg with it. Um, Thank you. And uh, I hope the production of Romeo and Juliet that you're directing now goes well. Thank you. It's in and great shape. Great. Um, yeah, that's it. That's all I have. Thank you very Wonderful. much indeed for your time.
Uh, you know, of course, that inherent in all this or, or implied in all this is if you want to come down to Macomb and see some unrehearsed Shakespeare in April, it would be wonderful to have you there. It's such a such not a tourist destination. Uh, so you may never have been there. I have and never it, been. But, uh, but, you know, if if you want to let me know, uh, because that that would be fun. If this whole conversation with you. Uh, well, reminds me that uh, it's been a long time since I've spent time with your wife. I would like to do that. It makes me think I have to find a way that I can come up and hang out with you and meet your children and Thank talk you. nerdy international phonetic alphabet and unrehearsed Shakespeare <laughs> stuff with you and be human beings together. That would be nice. Yes. Be nice. Yeah, I would love that. We let's, let's make that happen. Yes. Yeah, please. Let's do that. That would be great. Sure. And and Macomb April, I will I will discuss it with my okay. better half. Good, good, do that. Fantastic. Thank you again. Thank you so much for your time. I it's really been appreciate great it. Pleasure. Thanks. Lots of fun. Thank you. Good luck. To you. Have right. a have a great day. Thanks. Here. You do. Bye bye. Bye.